did a Watchmen broadcast. Coming to you from Watchmen Studios with another Watchmen video broadcast. It's been a while since I have been able to be in here. When I look back, I can see that the devil has fought me tooth and nail. Whatever that means. Um, even, even so far as taking away my whole ability to record. I'm recording now with a camera that has been part of this studio ever since I first bought it. It's been several years ago. I have another camera similar to it at a studio I have at my house so that I can record whenever time allows. Both uh, electrical cords to both of those cameras have been missing. Um, and when I got, I took this particular camera out to Colorado to film some things at MUFON, I get all the way out there and the cord that I thought would work on this camera did not work. And I bought it from Amazon. It didn't work. So I'm without a camera to do what it is that I do. So that, that if you saw my video from MUFON, you know, I, a guy showed up and I sent him out. God bless you, Chris, I love you. Um, he went out, I gave him some money, went out and bought a camera for us. And uh, I had planned on using that today. But I come in here feeling good and all of a sudden both cords are here. Now, how they got here, I have no idea. But that's just, that's a small example of how much the devil has tried to hold me back. Uh, well, let me say it like, let me say it better. <clears throat> it's just an example of God's timing. Does that sound better? Because not having cameras that worked caused the delay in doing this particular Watchman broadcast as part of the series called Taken. And since, since I started this, since I lost my ability to record, I've learned something from what has become a dear brother, a friend in the Lord that I met at MUFON. And it, with what I'm going to show you, I've always, part of me has been holding back because I'm going, man, this just, this is just going to sound so weird, so bizarre that once I say this, nobody in the world is going to believe it. Everybody's going to stop listening and we'll shut our ministry down and me and Sweetie Pie will get in our RV and just go, no, nobody, nobody will take me seriously anymore. But God had to show me something. And once he did, now I'm ready. So before the devil like flies, drops down through the ceiling, you know, Michael throwing him out of heaven and all and lands on top of my head, let's get going with it. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all of the tribes of the earth mourn why are they mourning? Because they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And all the tribes are going, uh-oh. 
the, yeah, that Hoggard guy and all those other Christians, they were right. And he shall, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And we know that Mark says it. He completes the, the picture of it. Matthew's only given you a partial picture. Mark is completing the picture because Mark says that he shall send his angels and they shall gather together his elect from one end of heaven to the other and from one end of the earth to the other. So we got all four bases covered on this thing. Okay, one end of heaven to the other, one end of earth to the other. That's four bases as far as I'm concerned. All right? Now, and it, it, it just kind of took me when I read these two verses and thought about it in relation to Matthew 24. Because the question in my mind is, when Jesus gathers together those elect from one end of heaven to the other, what, what heaven is he referring to? Is it referring to the first heaven, the sky above us, the second heaven, the realm of what they call outer space, and now that the James Webb telescope um, has a much better ability to see farther than, and clearer than we've ever seen before, we realize now there is a whole lot more real estate in the heaven above us than we ever, you flat earth people, you have no, you just, you cannot comprehend how big and how far God stretched, the Bible says. The Bible says that God stretched out the heavens. And they are huge, all right? So what heaven is he gathering together his elect from? Well, let's then take these two verses, Nehemiah and Deuteronomy, and look at them in that perspective. Now, I told you that... Uh, I've got like fresh air on this, fresh oil, whatever you want to call it, because of what a dear brother told me that he saw, and I believe him, I believe every word he said, because I can see it in scripture now, and, it, and what it does, it, and I'm not going to tell you the story yet, um, I promised him um, that he would be anonymous. And so I will never, ever give his name out unless he gives me permission to, which he may or may not. Uh, and that's, that's clergy confidentiality. You cannot force me to give you his name. There's no way in the world that I would, but legally I can't give out his name. But anyway, what he told me, absolutely phenomenal, blew my mind when I heard what he said. And it verifies these two verses here, all right? Um, in time, I will tell the story. I still won't give his name, but I'll tell the story, all right? Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 8. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, Though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. God is very clear on this. It's not, it's not a metaphor for something. He's not using imaginary language. It, it, he's not saying, I mean, even if, even if you were like in outer space, I would, you know how we talk. We exaggerate when we talk. That's us. We're liars. God cannot tell a lie, people. An exaggeration, you know, the fish story, that you, the, the fish that you caught that was this big, by the time you got home, the dead fish grew four inches. By the time you ate it and then told the story, the dead fish grew another three inches. Or that buck deer, that you shot and killed. First, it was a four-pointer. And then, 
you know, after a while, it was a sick. No, no, I remember distinctly that thing had 11 points on his head. You see, you see what I'm saying? We exaggerate, and exaggeration is not true. It's a lie. We're not telling the truth. God doesn't do that. He tells the truth, and he said, Though there were of you cast out under the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence. That's what he said. Now, that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's read exactly what was said. If any of thine be driven out unto the utter or the outmost parts of heaven, parts, plural, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And he's gathering. That word gathering, that's, let's see, is that the same word? Yet, and then she shall send, send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather. This is the gathering. I've done a, a watchman thing on this. The gathering. Look it up. He's gathering here people who are in the second heaven. The outmost parts, the farthest we haven't even seen, even with the web telescope, we haven't seen the end of space yet. That's huge. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. So, God has said now, in, in fact, let's, let's bring, uh, let's do this. If I haven't done it already, it's been so long, my goodness. I have, e even like in doing Pastor Mike online, trying to get this out was so difficult. It was just not impossible, but next to impossible. Joel Amos, that's where I want to be. In Amos chapter 9, God said, Though thou dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. And then he's, and now some people have said, Pastor, you're just, you're way off. Even, even in the story of the Tower of Babel, all they were doing was trying to build a tower that would reach the sky. Now, I want you to watch this. You know what I'm doing? I have just now reached the sky. Actually, the room I'm in is above the foyer of our church. The foyer of our church is at ground level. If I were standing outside and I reached up to this part here, which would be pretty hard, I would be reaching the sky. Okay? So, how tall does the building have to be to reach the sky? Well, we, they're everywhere. All you have to do is go like that, and you've reached the sky. So, no. And then, when he says it again in Obadiah, he makes it very clear what he means by this. He says in Obadiah, verse 4, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Oh, now, now he's saying it for how he means it. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, the eagle is landed, though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down the stars, all of those lights in the sky that we see at night. And man, right now, we're, we, are in, we are entering into the age of which guys like Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, and countless others wrote about years ago the day when man finally leaves this world. We've already We've already been to the moon. We're reaching out toward Mars and then beyond. The documents that were released as part of Freedom of Information Act uh, request with the threat of a lawsuit if you don't release them, 
the documents that were released to the Sun uh, newspaper in England from the Central Intelligence Agency, among those documents, I have them, I've, I've read through some of them, were articles of discussion on how warp drive is possible, on how it is possible to fold time space and bring two points that are 100 billion light years away from each other and bring them together so that man can travel them just like that. And those were written back in 70s, 80s, something like, I don't know exactly when they're written, but we're in that age now. And I believe that someday, I don't know when, a great advancement will take place. See, science often goes in like explosions. Like they make little bitty discoveries until one day there is an absolutely explosive discovery. And man advances himself hundreds of years in his knowledge and understanding of how things work and how to do this and how to do that. And that's happening a lot now in the age that we're living in now. Okay? What was it? We, from, the, from the day the Wright brothers flew, what was it, like, some, like 60 yards, something like that? It's a very small amount. From the day the Wright brothers flew their first airplane, 60 years later, we're landing on the moon. We hadn't been flying 60 years, and now we have flown and navigated to, we have left one moving object and aimed ourselves at another moving object and landed almost right on target. The reason why we didn't land on target, I'm, I know I'm taking time, but here the reason why we didn't land on target was uh, Neil Armstrong looked down and said, uh, there's some big boulders now. If we land on those, we're going to be sideways. So he kept on going with, I counted like 18 seconds of fuel left, something like that, to where he landed on the moon. And then they came back home. And we did it once. We did it several times after that. Twelve men landed on the moon. There's a story in the Bible. And I'm not going to get to it today, okay? Mm, anyway, uh, let's look at Psalm 114. The Bible is full of typological examples. I, I saw this verse one morning, uh, not too long ago. God woke me up. I'm reading the Psalms. Here's what I found. Psalm 114, verse 1. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language. What happened here? Let me ex explain this. We have, we have a, a typological event. In other words, this event happened in history. And according to the scriptures, it will happen again. So we have a picture. How long were they in Egypt? 400 years. That number four represents, number one, the gospel. And yes, this is how God saved Israel. But it also represents the spiritual realm. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. So that's why they were there 400 years. And 400 years... God then, God then sent them a Savior. From the last book of the Bible, um, Malachi, it was 400 years later that Christ came. Malachi being the 39th book of the Bible, Matthew being the 40th book of the Bible. That's where Christ came. In the 40th book of the Bible, 400 years after the last prophet Are you kidding me? There is a God, people, and he does everything in order. So here they are 400 years amongst a people who God didn't just say they were Egyptians. He said, a people of strange language. Now that's important because then God prophesied after they've come out of Egypt in Deuteronomy 28, what would happen if they did not follow God's word and keep his commandments? He said, Deuteronomy 28, verse 48, Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, 
from the end of the earth, way out there, as swift as the eagle flieth. Remember the eagle that built his nest among the stars? A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. That is the people of a strange language. I believe they are the same as far as prophecy is concerned. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. In the time that, since the last Watchman broadcast I made on this topic to today, I've been reading and studying and trying to uh, learn a whole lot more about this nation that's coming in the form of abduction stories. And you know what? Practically all people who say they have been abducted by aliens or have been taken up or whatever they call themselves, contactees, whatever. You know what they all said? Number one, they are mean looking. They have a fierce countenance big, evil, black eyes. What did Jesus tell us about the eyes? That the eyes be dark? What did he tell us? And then um, he talks here about they could not care less about human beings, whether they're old or young. And I won't tell you, I'm putting together notes. I'm, I'm reading these books and I'm, and I'm copying some of the things that these abductees reported. And let me tell you, the worst child molester you can think of pales in comparison to what these devils do to children in these ships. That's what I'm, that's what I'm prepared to tell you right now. It's absolutely disgusting. They care not. And some of the, a lot of the abductees report that in some cases the aliens will tell them we are trying to make a hybrid race. We're trying to change ourselves so that we can live on your planet. And in some cases they actually said we're going to take it over. That is exactly what God said Deuteronomy 28 was going to happen. I'm going to send a nation to you from out there. You will not ever be able to speak their language. They are mean, fierce countenance people. They could not care less about human beings, neither young or old. They will take and steal what they want, and they're here to take over. And that's going to happen when God kicks one-third of the angels completely out of heaven and they fall here to the earth, they're going to take over. They're beasts. And remember, in Genesis 1, God gave dominion of this earth to man. God said, Adam, ye shall have dominion over the beasts of the field, over the fowl of the air, and over every creeping thing that creepeth on, upon the earth. But in these last days, God is going to give these beasts dominion over man. And the spirit is already here in this world right now. So let's bring up two very important questions that have to be answered and they have to be dealt with biblically so that what I'm telling you, you could at least ponder, you could at least think about it, all right? Um, in all the years that I've been doing this, somebody asked me years ago, what keeps you from just going way out there? And I, I knew what he meant. He, he didn't offend me because, buddy, I can't go way out there. And it didn't take me long to think of an answer. I said, I'm anchored to the Word of God. If the Word of God says it, I'm going to say it. If the Word of God doesn't say it, no matter what my thoughts are, no matter how fantastic they might be, and no matter how many people I can get to believe them, if the Word of God won't say it, then I should keep my mouth shut and not say it either. So two important questions. Number one, are there other worlds that spirits, gods, 
devils, etc., can inhabit. Let's just stop for a minute and think about this question. And, and if you immediately say, no, hold on. They inhabit this one, correct? They inhabit this one. And it's, do they need our air? No, we don't think so. Do they need our water? No, I don't believe that either. So it's easy for them to inhabit this world. The scientists say that now that they've figured out how to detect a planet rotating around a star. And I've seen how they do it, and, and I'm going, and it's pretty convincing. And it, and it matches the way God does things. If we go all the way down to the atom, we have the atom with the, if you remember from your science, fifth grade science, you had the proton and the neutron in the middle. And then you had all the electrons spinning around in orbits around the proton and the neutron. Remember that? Okay. So our solar system, where the sun is, is exactly a picture of the atom. You have the sun and you have these planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, I don't say it the other way, Neptune. And then you have the little planetoids like Pluto. I'm sorry, Pluto, you lost, you lost being a planet. You're not a planet. And they're doing exactly what the electrons and atoms do. So it stands to reason all these other stars that are not only in this galaxy, the Milky Way, that we live in now, but in all these other quadrillions of other galaxies that are out there, I'm reasonably sure that they would, because they're the creation of God, that they would match the same pattern. Okay? So is it possible that devils have access to all of that? Well, it, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, they do. They're devils. They can go anywhere. All right? Second question. Are there nations or a nation or a people that are not of this world? And if I, were to, if, if I were to just leave it like that, you would go, boy, I don't know, Pastor Mike. But if I said devils, well, yeah, they're not from here. So what does that make them? Alien makes them alien, makes them not of this world. You can, let's just call them illegal aliens from now on, all right? We'll just say illegal aliens are coming to this world. I like that one. We'll just, we'll stick with that, all right? So now, we're going to, as I told you as we began this series, I was going to go back to the very early days, not 2009 when we started the Watchman broadcast. So I'm going all the way back to 1999. You're in, in those years there of my study of the Word of God and how God showed me how the Bible speaks to us. So you remember I, I taught you about typology, the pictures, the, the, the stories that are in the Bible that are true historically and they're true prophetically. They show forth what's going to happen in the future. The symbolism of numbers, the symbolism of colors, the symbolism of things or people in the Bible. Uh, typology, if it's a man, it's either going to be a picture of Christ or Antichrist. So if I say Abraham, that's Christ. He's a picture of, of Christ. Um, if I say Adam, he's a picture of Christ because he's the son of God. Luke, Luke chapter 3 says that. If I were to say Judas Iscariot. Well, that's is the picture of Antichrist. He's the man of sin. He's the son of perdition. Jesus himself said that. So you understand that. And so I taught you that. Then, um, now I'm going to teach you about the prophets and how they speak. Because I've said this before, years ago, back when, when Lisa and I were first married and I was working in construction for about the first seven or eight years of our marriage, and I'd get up and I'd hear all these preachers say, I get up five o'clock every morning and I read the Bible. 
and I would get up at 5.30 when my wife was about ready to leave to go to work, and I would try to read my Bible at 5.30 in the morning, and I'm just going. It's not that I was bored. That's just too early for me. And then I'm reading the prophets, and I'm just going. I, I don't comprehend this because this has already happened. If it's already happened, what relevance does it have? I wasn't, well, maybe I was being me. Back then, those weren't good days, some of them. But then God woke me up one day to those prophets and how they speak. Mike, God speaketh once, yea, twice. And I started thinking about that. And I went, oh. So let's look at that. How God speaks. How the prophets speak. Job 33. For God speaketh once, yea, twice. Yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. So number one, where does true instruction come from? Does it come from a teacher like me? Not on your life. It comes from the Word of God. People, the devil fights me hard. Hard. One of these days, I'm going to wake up dead. There's no doubt in my mind about it. I don't know when, don't know how, don't know how far away it is. And I'm not going to concern myself with that. What are you going to do after I stop making videos? You're going to do what I've been trying to tell you to do now all these years. Read your Bible yourself. You read it. Okay? And let God seal your instruction. Because once God, if I tell you aliens are coming and they're going to steal the Jews and take them to other planets and make them live there. If I tell you that, you're going to go, <laughs> I can't listen to this guy anymore. But if you read the scriptures and God opens that up to you and then he seals it in you, is it going anywhere? No. It's just like me with this King James Bible. I grew up preachers in this pulpit preaching out of a King James Bible, and I never, I never heard one of them. Never heard a single preacher, pastor in my life doubt the words of this book. wasn't until I got to Bible college. That's when they started telling me how wrong it was. And I believed that for several years. And then one day the Holy Spirit came in very gently and said, Mike, you know that Bible's right in everything it says, King James. And instantly God sealed that instruction in me. And I haven't turned back since and I'm not going to. Okay? But God speaks once. And see how God did it? God did it to me and with me the first part of my life up until I got to Bible college. Then it left, faded away, like the first temple, gone. But then, when he brought it back the second time, it's like God saying the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than of the first temple. Okay? Uh, two witnesses, out of the mouth of two witnesses shall every word be established. That's God speaketh once, yea, twice. There's a partial fulfillment and then a perfect fulfillment of everything that God says. Psalm 62, in fact, I got a, I got a, a, a God speaketh twice on this one. A double witness. Psalm 62, 11, God speaketh once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth to God. He said it again. You have two witnesses teaching you the doctrine that God speaks by two witnesses. <laughs> you have two witnesses that teaches you the doctrine that God speaketh once, yea, twice. And when he speaks the second time, it's a perfect fulfillment and it's sealed and it's done. It's over with. No more. Okay? 
So think about God speaketh once. He gave the law to Moses and they killed all of these goats and lambs and oxes and everything else. They killed them all as sacrifices. That's God speaketh once. But that was only a temporary, partial sacrifice for man's sins. God speaketh twice. Jesus said, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. Now man's salvation is sealed forever through the perfect Lamb of God. Oh, you could just go, you could do this all day long with scriptures, I'm telling you. So you see it in things like we have the Old Testament, God speaketh once. New, the maps, God speaketh thrice. No, the, the New Testament, God speaketh twice. Uh, the Mount Sinai Covenant, which I referenced a while ago. Kill, kill these lambs and goats and oxen, and you shall have your sins forgiven for a day or a year. And that's it. Sacrifice the perfect lamb, which is the perfect law of liberty. That's God speaketh twice. Now it's done. It's a perfect fulfillment. You see it now? The, your first birth. As glorious as everybody said, oh, he's a, he's a really cute baby, isn't he, hon? Oh, okay. As glorious as you thought your first birth was, your second birth is a whole lot better, isn't it? That's God speaketh once and God speaketh twice. Because the book of your first coming, your first birth, was DNA, which God, he spoke that. He wrote it. In thy book, all my members were written. The first coming of Christ, a partial fulfillment of prophecies. I'll get there. The second coming of Christ, perfect fulfillment of all prophecies, all things. Um, the first heaven and first earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, the two things, the heaven and the earth. But they were only a partial. They're, go they're all going to be burnt up, just like the first temple was, just like this body is, just like what Paul, I think it was Paul in the Hebrews, said uh, that the law is getting old like a garment. Okay? Uh, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. So what's he going to do with this first and I've been to the, mount, the mountains of Colorado. They're absolutely beautiful. Been to the Grand Canyon. We just saw that last year. I've seen it before. It's amazing. Niagara Falls. Uh, seeing the, um, the, uh, the Rift Valley of Kenya and seeing the animals. I mean, just, this world is beautiful. But it's nothing compared to the second one. God's got to get rid of the first one. He taketh away the first and it may establish the second. You see it now, how God speaketh once, yea, twice. He taketh away the first speech that he may establish the second speech. The first word, the second word. A, a partial fulfillment of prophecy and then a perfect latter days fulfillment of prophecy. So let me show you how that works. Okay. So open your Bible. You do this. I, I'm going to put it up on the screen, but I want you to do this. I'm going to do it. Turn to um, Isaiah. 61, Isaiah 61, okay, um, and while we're doing that, I just, I had a thought this morning, remember how the Bible talks about when Herod had all the babies killed, that it was a fulfillment of prophecy, Rachel weeping for her children, and if you go read, that's in Jeremiah, and if you read Past that, there's a lot more things that God's going to do than just Rachel weeping for her children. It's a lot more judgment coming out of God at that time. So that event is going to happen again. Okay? Isaiah 61 and Luke 4. Isaiah, and so we're going to compare. Isaiah 61. Verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, semicolon, to comfort all that mourn. Let me look at verse 2 again. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God, semicolon, to comfort all that mourn. Now, semicolon. Now, that sentence doesn't end even in verse 2. It keeps going into verse 3, and it ends in verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, Jesus in Luke 4 goes to the synagogue to do what his father did, his father before him did, so on and so on. And that is, you go to the temple or go to the synagogue for the reading of the scripture. So, he goes and they hand him the book. The book. The book, right? You get it? 66 books of the Bible. Isaiah, 66 chapters. He opens the book. Watch this. There was delivered unto him, Luke 4, 17, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. He's quoting, again, from Isaiah 61. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. You see what he just did? Where there was a comma, in, up, if you look up in verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable of the year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God. But when he got to to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, period. He stopped and he closed the book, just like DNA does. When DNA, when your body needs more insulin, then the book is opened, it's unrolled like a scroll. They find the part where the insulin recipe is, a copy is made. That's called uh, RNA transcription, and it's a perfect copy. Once the copy is made, then the RNA polymerase reads the book, just like Jesus did. Now, if your body needs more insulin, and say that it finds the recipe for insulin, and then right after that, it finds the recipe for, I don't know, snot. Okay, your body makes snot. You don't. You don't eat and drink snot, do you? Okay, your body makes it. So what if in making insulin, it didn't stop after insulin? It just kept on reading and making. Well, now you've got a lot of insulin in your body and you're just snots running everywhere. But your body doesn't need the snot, right? I know you kids are laughing. Some of you adults are too. I am. Okay. You see what I'm saying? The body doesn't need any more snot, so we're not going to make any snot. We're going to make insulin. And Jesus closed the book at exactly the right place, and he said, we're done. And he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus just showed you how he's going to, how he's going to fulfill everything. Because even though he closed the book after he said the acceptable year of the Lord, this is now the acceptable time. Now is the time to get saved. Behold, now is the day of salvation, Paul said. Now, it's time now to do it. Don't wait on later. Because if you wait on later, it may not be the acceptable year of the Lord anymore. It may be the day of vengeance of our God. And then, buddy, you'll be in a pile of snot. Okay, so you see how it works? What came after in Isaiah 61, the acceptable year of the Lord, it was not ready to be fulfilled yet. 
So Jesus closed the book. He knew what he was doing. He's God. When he comes back, he's going to take the book from his father's hand. He's going to unseal the book. And then it's going to be the day of vengeance of our God. See it now? God speaketh once, partial fulfillment. God speaketh twice, perfect fulfillment. Okay? Absolutely perfect. Oh, by the way, let me, let me just pull something in here that's not related to this. It has everything to do with a new Bible that I mentioned uh, the, in a Pastor Mike online. John MacArthur's coming out with a new Bible. It's actually a version of the New American Standard Bible. He's got permission from the Lockman Foundation to change the New American Standard, how he wants it. And what he's going to do first is take out all the places where you find the word servant and replace them with slave because he is a Calvinist and he believes that Slaves don't get a choice in their salvation. God just makes them saved. So you're a slave to God, number one. Number two, he's going to, in my opinion, he's going to commit a heresy and he's going to blaspheme the name of God. And he's going to take the name of the Lord in vain is what he's going to do. Because he believes that in the Hebrew, yod he vah he it's where we get the word Jehovah from, which is almost always in the King James translated as Lord with all capital letters, right? MacArthur believes that that's wrong, that it's not Lord. So he's going to take all of those Lords out of the Old Testament, all of them, and replace them with Yahweh. But is he right in that? Let's go back and look at our screen here. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now, you see the capital G-O-D? That means, it, and it's the same as where you would see capital L-O-R-D. All in capital letters. It's where the yod he vah he is in Hebrew. But look at what Jesus said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And it doesn't matter if it's here or any other place in the New Testament. Every single time in the New Testament where it's quoting from the Old Testament, where that yod heh vah is, every, not, not most of the time, I'm, tell, I'm telling you every single time. In the Greek, it's written as Kyrios, which means Lord. So would Jesus lie? Would Jesus make that mistake? Would Jesus read? And they would say, well, he was given a Greek copy of the... He's a Jew in a Jewish synagogue. They wouldn't read out of a Greek copy of the Old Testament. Are you kidding me? But here... Luke is writing it down as the Holy Ghost told him to and told him to write the word Kyrios, Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. So the name, yod heh vah -He, is Lord. Deal with it. Um, here's another one, Joel chapter 2. Let's do that one. Let's turn to Joel 2, and you all know where uh, Joel 2 was preached, right? You know that one, right? Uh, uh, sure, Pastor Mike. We know it. It's in the book of uh, Acts chapter 2. Yeah, yeah, see, that I knew that. People, you need to learn your Bible. Need to learn your Bible. Acts chapter 2. Now, let's read Joel first. Joel 2, verse 28. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. 
And I will shew wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, that is Joel chapter 2. And so when Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost to preach the first sermon where 3,000 people got saved, because they said, what, what, shall, what must we do to be saved? And Peter, Peter said, well, I just told you, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? So let's read uh, Acts chapter 2. Now, this prophecy, Joel 2, the primary function of this prophecy is to foretell that God is going to pour out His Spirit. And you and I are recipients of that Spirit because we believe what God said. God has sealed us with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the day of, the, of redemption comes. So we have in us, sealed in us, the Holy Spirit of God. Now here is Peter reading it. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, that happened on the day of Pentecost. That's why Peter was reading or quoting from that passage. The Holy Ghost was giving him utterance, the Bible says. And how was he doing it? Giving him utterance in a different language, like English. Well, I don't believe a translation can be inspired. Well, that's how God started the church in Acts chapter 2, by inspiring translations. That's how he did it. Well, I, I do. I believe God can inspire a translation, because he did. He guided those men over seven years, some 54 men, plus other scholars, and they called them divines back then, just men of God, preachers, and so on, who knew the languages, who would help out in troublesome areas to make sure that they were getting it right. Love that. Oh, let's read Acts. Let's keep reading. Because Peter kept quoting Scripture. This is what he said was going to happen. Verse 19, And I will shew wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now again, if we look back in Joel 2, um, and we look in verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, colon, the sentence is not done, but Peter stops at whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let's look at a list here of things that God said was going to happen when he poured out his spirit. I will show wonders in heaven, signs in the earth. There will be blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood. So there were seven things that Peter said Joel prophesied and warned were going to happen. But they didn't happen. They didn't happen. On the day of Pentecost, there were no wonders in heaven. There was no signs in the earth. There was no blood. There was no fire. There was no pillars of smoke rising up. The sun was not dark. The moon had not turned to blood. None of those things happened. None of them. So did God lie? Or, you know, this, this, is how, this is how some 
This is how liberals talk. Well, you know, it, a case could be made for the metaphorical version of this. The blood, signifying the blood of Christ, washing our sins away. The fire is the fire of God that lights the path and, and burns off all the dross of sin and the, the vapor of, uh, of the pillars of smoke is, is held, is, is inflamed at the presence of God on the earth. And, and I'm making this up as I go, you understand that, because that's what they do. And the sun being turned to darkness, why? Because the sun of God is shining way brighter than the sun that lights our earth. See, I just made that up. That's pretty good, wasn't it? But that's not, that's not what, what it is. What it is, is this is only what happened at Pentecost was only a partial fulfillment. Is there an outpouring, a second outpouring going to take place? Yes. Do you remember when Elijah went to heaven in a space chariot? And, yeah, I know it was angels, right? Okay. A uh, chariot of fire and horses of fire. Angels are made of fire. And El Elisha, Elijah said, ask, if you ask me anything before I leave, I'll, I'll give it to you. And Elisha said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Double. That's the word two, twice. Elijah said, that's a hard thing. You should ask me for a million bucks, right? No. But if thou, if you see me when I am taken away, it's yours. So what happened? Elisha was watching and the 50 of the sons of the prophets were watching when the chariot came down and Elijah stepped in the chariot and the whirlwind took them all up into heaven. And Elisha there now has the mantle of Elijah and he folds it. What do you do when you fold something? You double it. And he smites the waters of Jordan and walks across on dry ground. Buddy, he's got it now. And see, Elisha received the second outpouring. Elisha is Israel. Elijah is us who are taken up first. Then Elisha. Okay? And, and just, you can see that all. God said, I'm going to. You don't like this one. Remember how I said um, after 400 years from Malachi to Matthew? Um, and then Matthew was the 40th book of the Bible, okay? In Isaiah 40, it prophesies of John the Baptist, Elijah, and it starts out by saying, comfort ye, comfort ye. Why do you say it twice? Because it's, this is comfort ye, God speaketh once. This is comfort ye, God speaketh twice. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry out unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. I love it. I love it. I love this book. Now, I'm going to leave you with a cliffhanger. Okay, you remember what that is? Back in the old days where they had the serial movies, came in a series, that was before the TV shows. Um, as you were watching the movie on Saturday afternoon and all of a sudden the hero would be hanging from a cliff and they would say, tune in next week to see if the, and then by the next week when the movie starts out, he's up on top again. You don't see how he did it, but you know, he's, that's what a cliffhanger is. Let's read the cliffhanger for next week.
And the reason why I'm pointing out this is how God speaks in these prophecies is that there are prophecies in this book that although they have had a fulfillment, the fulfillment they had was only a partial fulfillment. There is coming for each of these prophecies a perfect latter days fulfillment. Jeremiah is one of those prophets. And let's read what Jeremiah said. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 12, Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Now, what direction is Jeremiah supposed to yell that in? The north. Why the north? Because that's where Israel is. In the north. Jeremiah 3.18 In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. And just very quickly, I've done this before, but here's a map of the north. What land is up there? There isn't one. There's no land. And it, isn't it interesting that there is an entire landmass, a huge landmass, Antarctica is huge, that sits at the South Pole and covers the South Pole and a lot of the areas around the South Pole. But there is absolutely no land at the North Pole. So, how shall they come together out of the land of the North when there isn't a land of the North? We're going to explore that next time. All right? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for forbearing with me all this time. And uh, pray for our ministry, pray for the work we do in Kenya, pray for all the things that we do around the world. You are the reason why we do what we do. And the reason why the people in our church sometimes suffer, okay? It's because you're worth it. You're worth it, I promise you. If God loves you, we can too, all right? God bless you, we'll see you next time, bye-bye.